There's a wonderful place we call home. Tis a city of glory divine. It is built in the garden of rest. And that beautiful home shall be mine. Oh, that wonderful Eden so blessed. Where Jesus the Master has gone. To prepare us this glorious home. There he bids us a welcome to come. O oh, wonderful city of God, just across in that bit in that climb, where the angels sweet echo of song, in musical cadences chime. Oh, o wonderful city of God, by faith in the distance I see, there's a mansion prepared over there. Yes, a place in that city for me. Oh, how sweet it will be there to dwell with the Savior and Father of all in a palace of diamond and gold where no evil to us can befall. There no sorrow that home shall invade and our loved ones no more there shall die. One celestial, unbroken, sweet day, while eternity's ages roll by. O oh, wonderful city of God, just across in that beautiful climb, where the angels' sweet echo of song in musical cadences chime. O oh, wonderful city of God. By faith in the distance I see, there's a mansion prepared over there. Yes, a place in that city for city for me. When the jewels of Jesus are brought, there to shine in that land of sweet song. What a beautiful, beautiful thought that I shall be there in that throng. Sweetest peace to my soul it will be To behold such a glorious sight Where the sun and the moon neither shine But the glory of God is the light O oh, wonderful city of God Just across in that beautiful climb Where the angels sweet echoes of song in musical cadences chime, chime. O oh, wonderful city of God, by faith in the distance I see. There's a mansion prepared over there. Yes, a place in that city for me. Our lesson this evening is lesson number 92. Who has the page number for that one? 332. 332. Lesson 92 is the beginning of a second set of parables that Jesus speaks. Uh, a lot of those concerning the kingdom, uh, the relationship of Jesus and the Pharisees. Uh, events that are coming up toward the crucifixion, rejection of Jesus. Uh, tonight, uh, we're looking in the book of Luke chapter 15. And so if you don't have uh, the workbook or you don't want to uh, keep the workbook open, if you just want to follow along with the Scriptures, it's all going to be coming out of Luke chapter 15 beginning in verse 1. And in this particular chapter, as we look at this, uh, we find three uh, parables that Jesus speaks. Uh, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then the longer of the three, which is the parable of the prodigal or wasteful son. And so as we... Uh, the uh, chapter opens up in verse 1. It says, Now all the publicans and sinners were drawing near unto him to hear him. 
And both the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. All throughout the uh, Gospels, we see a broken relationship between the religious leaders and those they referred to as publicans, which were the, the dreaded tax collectors, but more so also that group that they referred to as sinners. To be classified as a sinner, one could, yes, be involved in things like fornication, adultery, various uncleanness, as we've been studying some of those things on Sunday morning. But not only in the works of the flesh, but also the Pharisees and the scribes placed most people who did not follow their customs or their traditions in the category of sinners also. And so when we see Jesus and His disciples eating without going through the ceremonial washing of the hands. That type of behavior, though it is not mentioned in the Scriptures, because it contradicted the traditions of the elders, the Pharisaic teachers and their scribes, one would have been considered a sinner. And so if you didn't follow their customs and traditions as well as uh, the, uh, the law, the written law. So for the Pharisees, there was the written law of Moses and there was the oral law. And these two, the Pharisees referred to as the law, written and oral. Now, the Sadducees tend to accept only the written law of Moses. But the Pharisees could group you in a category of a sinner for many reasons that today you and I might look at and say, excuse me? Uh, you know, ex ex excuse me? I mean, is, is, are you serious about that? But their strict interpretation uh, of the oral law set both Jesus and others apart as sinners. And when even if you go to the synagogue or have went to the synagogue and you've heard the law of Moses read, you realize that a lot of that's not in there. I mean, I mean it's not in the written law. But the Pharisees still enforced the oral law with that. And so when we look here and see that they murmured, saying that He receiveth sinners and eateth with them, and we're, we can't be fully sure exactly who all this applies to that was there. You and I might look at most of those and say, uh, you know, I, I don't understand why the Pharisees call them sinners. And so it, it was room for confusion. And so if you didn't follow the customs or the teachings of the Pharisees, you got branded in essence a sinner. And so that puts you on the outcast of the good Jew. And so there were many of the common people who had been classified as sinners uh, primarily because they didn't follow certain customs or oral traditions that was not in the Scriptures. And so many of these people had, in a way, got a rough break because they were branded sinners not having been convicted of any law uh, 
of Moses. It was just the customs and traditions of the elders. So here comes a man like Jesus, and Jesus uh, speaks and talks to them on a, on a level and in a way that they can recognize. The Pharisees keep saying this man is a sinner. Well, you know, we don't you know, all, know all the details, but we know he's a sinner. And so that some of these people who had got a misidentification, now we know all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, so we, we can't, you know, there's a certain aspect that everyone is, is a sinner. But we're talking about those who, uh, being branded a sinner, we would think of as the outcasts, the wicked people, those who care not today, we'd think of those who don't care anything about church, those people who, who have no real concept of morality. But in that day, just the fact that you didn't follow the table customs of washing your hands before you eat, that could get you branded a sinner. So Jesus meets up with these people and they watch Him and they see Him eat and sometimes uh, again, he doesn't wash his hands and the disciples don't wash their hands. And the Pharisees try to brand them also sinners. But his message rings true to these individuals. These are people that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, should have been concerned about but in, in a way, they were excommunicating them from fellowship. They were disfellowshipping them. And there didn't seem to be any genuine care. I mean, I'm not saying that there were no Pharisees that cared, but in what we see in the Scriptures, those who constitute the leadership of the Pharisees and the scribes, there seemed to be no great concern to bring them back into the fold other than just branding them sinners. And if you ever want to change your way, you're welcome to come back. But Jesus uh, was willing to go where they were. And again, Jesus ate with publicans and sinners, not because He wanted to be a publican, not because He wanted to share in the wealth of the publicans. He was with the sinners, not because He wanted to partake of any sins that they genuinely were committing. But these people were outcasts, and Jesus was greatly concerned about what the future of their soul would be like. And these people eagerly embraced Jesus, and in many ways, He eagerly embraced them. Not their sins, but He showed a genuine concern for them. Uh, you have people like little Zacchaeus, we all, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, we all, the children sing the song about the tax collector who climbed up in the sycamore tree to see the Lord. Jesus went to his house and ate with him. And again, we see uh, the signs of genuine repentance in his life. And, you know, if he had wronged anyone, he was going to pay that back. Plus, uh, in addition. Yeah. You know, the, those who are well have no need of a physician. And of course, the Pharisees prided themselves, the, the strict Pharisees prided themselves on their ability to not only keep the written law, but their customs and traditions. And they really put more emphasis on their customs and traditions. And this was an issue Jesus had. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You know, there are things that fall into the realm of opinion. We've said this before. Opinions tend to differ. But just because one differs in matters of opinion does not necessarily make one a sinner. 
But when there is an entire class of people labeled sinners and publicans, and at the same time there does not seem to be any genuine care for them, this was troublesome to Jesus. So I say this to kind of paint a picture, an arc of what's going on here in the 15th chapter. Here are these supposed leaders of Israel. These are the people who are supposed to be taking care of the things of God. But they're not concerned about these lost sheep of Israel, that they claim to be lost sheep. And so Jesus uses these three parables to address them. One is the parable of the lost sheep. And when He talks about the parable of the lost sheep, people could shake their heads in agreement. Then He talks about the parable of the lost coin. Nobody likes to lose money. Uh, I have to admit that now that I'm uh, getting up in years a bit, when I drop coins in a store, I, have to, I look to see what they are, whether or not it's worth bending over to pick them up. You know, if it's a, a dime and a few pennies, I'll just leave it on the floor because I'm, uh, I'm not going to bend down to pick that up. But again, lost coin, something of value that's missing and is important. You know, you'd go to great lengths to retrieve that or to find it. And so in the parable of the lost coin, we have that again. And then there is the parable of the prodigal son. Now we move from sheep to coins, and then we have the prodigal son. We have the father's love of that son. And as we get to the end of that parable, we have an older brother and then the younger brother. And the older brother is sitting on the porch. He won't even go in the house when he finds out his brother has returned. And his father comes out and talks to him about his brother. You know, everything I have is yours. But, you know, your brother, you know, he was lost, but now he's found. He's come back home. And he is invited to rejoice with them. And the interesting thing is, the parable ends there. And the reason it ends there is, is it leaves on the shoulders of the Pharisees. What are you going to do about these lost sheep of Israel? Do they have no value? What about a, a man? Is a man not more valuable than a sheep or a coin? Shouldn't you come rejoicing that the sheep are returning back to the fold. And that parable ends without a resolution. And it was meant to put that resolution on the shoulders of the Pharisees to see if they would understand that He was talking about them. God loves everyone. He loves His sheep. He, he sees the value in the soul. He doesn't like it when people go astray, literally, or again, uh, don't like them to be outcast or pushed off from society. But what are we going to do? Are we going to treat them like dirt? Are we going to ignore them? Are we going to be standoffish? Are we going to cast them out to the side? Are we just going to label them as rejects? You know, many times, uh, I had a teacher once who worked in a Chevy assembly plant in Ohio, and they would receive uh, parts in that were intended to be welded into the body's roof frame, whatever, 
But sometimes when they received them, there was some issue with those parts. And so as to not mistake them, they were stamped, rejected by Chevrolet so that people would understand we're not supposed to be putting them in our cars. And so they became outcast. So the, the real message of these three parables is we can identify people as sinners. Literally, what they've done, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. But the question is, do you care about these people who've been rejected? What are you willing to do about these people who have been stamped by society, rejected by the Pharisees? And so today, that still uh, comes down to us when we think about those who are lost, when we think about those who are not a part, don't know the gospel. Uh, what, what is our care? What is our concern about those things? And so we have to be careful that we don't take upon us the, the persona of the Pharisees. <laughs> that man's eating with publicans and sinners. N nobody was rejoicing that publicans and sinners were coming to hear a man teach morals and when you listen to the Sermon on the Mount, when you listen to things Jesus taught, He wasn't teaching them to necessarily rebel against the Pharisees or rebel against Moses. You know, He was teaching them how they ought to live together, uh, loving one another, loving their neighbors, loving their enemies, praying for one... I mean, He wasn't asking them to take up swords and attack the temple and throw the Sadducees out and dethrone the Pharisees. He just was talking to these people and it resonated with them. And so, uh, as we look at this, they make that statement. They murmured among themselves about the way He behaved in receiving these publicans and sinners. That implies also to me that the publicans and the sinners were not welcome anywhere the Pharisees sit down to eat. There was the concept of table fellowship, who they would sit down, who they would eat with. And they would only sit down and eat with those they deemed to be righteous individuals. They would not eat with Gentiles and they would not eat with publicans and sinners. And Jesus uh, was embracing, they were rejecting. And so we come to this first parable of the lost sheep. And he spake unto them this parable, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, and having lost one of them, did not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he left it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he come home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that even so there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine righteous persons who need no repentance. And that's what Guy was talking about. You know, it's, it's great that the ninety-nine stayed, but the ninety-nine stayed. It's the one hundredth that is lost. During that time, uh, there were uh, various shepherds who many times would work together. They would uh, put their sheep together in the sheepfold in the night if they were using the sheepfold, or they would guard the sheep. And so if one shepherd saw that his 
sheep were missing or a sheep was missing. He would leave the 99 and go look for the one. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were just left there by themselves because he talks about his neighbors. He talks about here, uh, you know, his friends and his neighbors. And in that sense, it could very well be other shepherds who were there. You know, watch my sheep while I go look for the one which is lost. Well, again, uh, the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the leaders of Israel were charged with watching for the sheep. But who's looking for the ones that are missing? You just shrug your shoulder and say, hey, it's only one. And then there's another one. Well, that's only one. It's only one. It's only one. It's only one. And then before long, you got 90 sheep. And before long, you got 80 sheep. If you're just worried that it's just one, don't worry about it. If that's your attitude, then again, you're going to have some problems. And so Jesus speaks to them about something that would no doubt have been something seen quite frequently, discussed, known about, practices and policies among shepherds, in how they took care of their flock. And so Jesus isn't talking to the publicans and the sinners, but He's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. And He says, suppose you had a hundred sheep and one of them is lost. Would you not want to leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until you find it? And how long do you stay away from the ninety and nine? And Jesus says, Your determination is until you find it. And we look for the lost until we find it, until it's brought back, until it's no longer lost, but it's found. And that causes rejoicing uh, because other shepherds would have experienced the same thing. And they would have helped watch each other's flocks while they went looking for it. They would have cared. But the Pharisees are just shaking their head, you know, about these publicans and sinners. We just let them keep wandering off. Oh, that's just another lost sheep. That's just another lost sheep. That's just another lost sheep. That's just a bunch of lost sheep. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Even if it was one, you would go looking for it. And by implication is, what if you had 25? What if you had 50? What if 75 went off in every direction? I mean, how many does it take before you're concerned? Now, there was this whole herd of publicans and sinners, and they had let them wander off in essence from their oversight because they were the ones charged as being, in essence, shepherds over the household of Israel. They had just let them wander off, let them wander off, let them wander off, and they were happy just to brand them lost. And that's what happens when you brand someone a sinner, what you're saying is lost. We're not even going to look for you. You're lost. You wandered off. It's your own fault. Whatever happens to you, that's your fault. I didn't make you become a tax collector. I didn't make you do what you did to wander off. And so there, there seemed to be no attempt to return them to the fold. And so Jesus shows us that to the shepherd, that one sheep is precious. And not only did he doesn't say he ties a rope around its neck, doesn't say he grabs it with the shepherd's hook, crook, and, and yank it and pull it back, but he picks it up and he puts it on his shoulders, probably wraps it around his head like some of the mink stalls, holding its feet in the front and feet in the back 
so that you know it don't get loose, can't wiggle its way free. And so he brings that back, and he, uh, the the fellow shepherds see that, and he calls them to rejoice in that he has found his sheep, which is lost. And we have this statement. Jesus says, "I say unto you." that even so there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Now over the years I've, I've thought about that and I've, I've thought about you know why the angels would rejoice so much over one being returned uh, than the 99 just. I mean, it would seem like the angels would be more concerned about the ones who were uh, still in the fold, so to speak. But then as I studied and thought about Matthew 13, there's various parables in there also that Jesus speaks about, but one of those is the parable of the tares and the wheat. And it talks about and Jesus' interpretation of that is that when the final reaping comes, the reapers are the angels. And they will remove out of the kingdom all those things which offend. Matthew 25 tells us when Jesus comes again that the sheep will be separated from the goats. And it appears that those who are charged with separating the sheep from the goats, separating the tares from the wheat, are the angels. And when one person repents and turns back to God, when they're forgiven of their sins, that's one less person that the angels are going to have to sentence to eternity. Now, it's, it's not them directly, but it's their responsibility. When this life is over, when we breathe our last breath a little later, we'll talk about Lazarus and the rich man, but we know it says about Lazarus, the angels carried him into the bosom of Abraham. These angels would much more carry a soul into the bosom of Abraham, the concept or idea of paradise, than for one to be cast into torment. Knowing that there is no second chance. It's appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment. So the angels rejoice in every soul that's saved because they know that when they breathe their last breath, if they're faithful unto God, those who are reconciled, those who are brought back, that's one less soul that they have to be sorrowful for. I can't imagine what it must be like for the angels to escort those who have sinned into torment make sure they don't end up in the wrong place. Uh, and so it's, it's a, re a very good reason why it is that the angels rejoice over the one that repents than the 99. It's not that they're not concerned about the 99 that are faithful. They rejoice, but they rejoice more that someone has been brought back uh, into the fold. You might have any comments or questions, observations on that. One of the passages that it mentions in this section is Ezekiel 30, uh, uh, Ezekiel 34, uh, in there where uh, God asks the question, does the Lord have pleasure in the death of the wicked? The Lord finds no pleasure in the death of the wicked because all is lost. Everything that they were, everything that they might have been, everything that they could have accomplished, all is truly lost. It has perished. The Lord finds no death or no 
delight in the death of the wicked. However, that doesn't mean that he won't keep the wicked from dying. And so likewise, both God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The angels have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, have no pleasure in those who are the outcasts. Sub, subdivision C here deals with the lost coin. And Jesus goes on in asking them, getting them to contemplate, or what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it? And when she found it, she calleth together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I have lost. Now she might even seek others to help her find the coin. I know I had ten, and I only have nine. I must have dropped one somewhere. Now in the houses of that day, in the common or average person's home, the floor was dirt. And as you walked on the floor, the dirt gets loose and it gets kind of powdery. And so it's quite possible that if you dropped a coin in the floor, that the day-to-day -day dust in walking through the house would cover it up. And that's why she's sweeping the floor. That's why she is uh, doing her house cleaning, is that she's diligently sweeping the entire floor uh, considering that one has probably fallen and she needs to find it. Now, Jesus again says, Even so I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And so uh, we, we have basically the same concept. And as I've said, it's, it's kind of sad that, you know, we would look for a sheep, we would look for a chicken, we'd look for a dog that wandered off. People who lose their pets will go out driving around looking for them. We'll expend all kinds of effort. But then we've got a whole group of people with souls that are lost and all we want to do is keep branding them sinners, and anybody who has anything to do with them are sinners. Well, how are you going to convert a sinner if you don't go to them, if you don't talk to them, if you don't interact with them, and if they invite you into their house, you insult them and by saying, no, you're a sinner, I can't come in and talk to you. Why don't you come out here on the stoop? I can talk to you on the stoop, but I can't come in your house. Uh, add insult to injury. That's really going to uh, open the opportunity to talk to them. So one of the things about sinners is if you're going to talk with sinners, if you're going to convert, convert sinners, if you're going to bring sinners back to the fold, you have to go where they are. And I think this is one of the issues that's facing the church today. You know, we're kind of in a pharisaic time where we expect the sinners to come back to us. We expect them to come through the door and sit down with us. We expect them to call us and ask, what must I do to be saved? Now, I'm not saying that doesn't ever happen, but I think we all know that it's not the common way that things get fixed. The sinner usually does not go looking for someone to guide them and direct them back. And so if they're going to come back, chances are that they're going to have to have someone who is concerned about them enough to go and talk with them to tell them that we're concerned, to tell them that you know things aren't the way they need to be. And I'm pretty sure if you really look down deep in yourself, you know that's true. I mean, I know sometimes pride keeps us from admitting things, but 
Okay, and if, if people are honest with themselves, they know when something's broken. They know when their home is broken. They know when their family, their marriage, they know when things are broken. Now, pride again keeps them from acknowledging that. But you know, the saddest of all is that the Pharisees, as long as Jesus was talking about sheep, you know, as long as, as we just talk about things in general, uh, they, they were comfortable. But when Jesus begins to talk about the prodigal son, we're not talking about a coin anymore. Now we can all see value in it and we'd all look for it. And the sheep. But when it comes to the human soul, that's the hard part. And so Jesus begins to talk to them about the lost son. And our time is, is running out for tonight to get into part C. We probably need to just keep that till next week. But, you know, we have God the Father who has placed each of us here in this world. Some of us are brighter, smarter, more talented than others. Again, some people always are looking for the easy out, shortcut. Life is filled with all kinds of decisions. Some people, it's, it, it just seems like no matter what happens, you know, they could fall in a mud hole and get up pristine condition. I mean, that just, some people just seem to go through life and everything works out. But there's a lot of different decisions, a lot of different roads that people travel in life. There is a lot of people like the prodigal son. You know, for years, I never really questioned or asked. Most people don't. What is a prodigal son? Most people would, would answer that. Well, the prodigal son is the one that went astray. Yeah, but what does it mean to be a prodigal son? Going astray is not what prodigal means. And the word prodigal means wasteful. He is the one who squandered his inheritance. He blew his chance, so to speak, his opportunity. And a lot of people in life make bad decisions. And a lot of them, like the prodigal son that we will see next week, find themselves feeding the swine and looking at the husk, trying to figure out how he can make a meal out of that, how he can still make this thing work. Sometimes it takes a while before we come to our senses. Sometimes if perhaps someone would intercede on our behalf, before we ended up being branded sinners and tax collectors and, and being treated as outcasts. Um, again, we're not really sure about the relationship between the older brother and the younger brother. From the message that uh, we see in the parable, it doesn't seem like their relationship was really all that good to start with. The father rejoiced when the young brother returned, but the older brother wasn't too happy about it. And so we'll look at some of that next week, Lord willing, as we uh, get into subdivision D uh, in the parable of the lost son or the parable of the prodigal son. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth.
And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.